Young schoolgirls kidnapped and killed. A three-year-old child murdered in town square. Ticking time bombs laced with a deadly virus hidden in public schools across the country. What if I told you the world's most deadly serial killer was fake news? That's right, fake news is a serial killer, and it's a killer that can't be caged because it acts like a virus, spreading and infecting the masses. How many times have you spread fake news? How many times and who have you infected? But what really is fake news? How can it cause real harm? Why should we care? And what, if anything, can we do to stop it? Well, let's start by making a distinction between two different kinds of fake news. On the one hand, Fake news is false information that's presented as true news when it's not. And in this sense, it's more accurate to call this kind of fake news false news. On the other hand, fake news is a phrase we can use to cast doubt on a particular piece of information. Now, we can call something fake news if it's true news or false news. Calling a piece of false news fake news is a great way to stop fake news from spreading. But what if we call a piece of true news, fake news. Well, in this sense, the phrase fake news can be used as a tactical form of propaganda intended to discredit any piece of information that doesn't align with a particular preferred agenda or doctrine. Merely calling something fake news is often sufficient for seeding doubt, and sometimes that's all it takes to convince someone something's false when it's really true. So why does this seem like more of a problem now than ever before? Well, one reason is because it's easier to make things that look newsworthy. Back in the day, if you wanted to do that, you'd have to go through a few very well-established specific channels. Printing presses and TV stations are expensive and difficult to operate, creating a significant financial and educational barrier for anyone who wanted to make true or false news. They say news travels faster than ever before, but fake and false news travel faster. In the words of Mark Twain, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. Ironically, though this quote is often attributed, attributed to Mark Twain, scholars say that he likely didn't say that. Another contributing factor to the abundance of fake and false news is money. The news used to be a loss leader. It wasn't programming that made the stations any money. In fact, the only reason why they produced and broadcast it was in an effort to bring the older generations away from the radio and to television. It wasn't until the Vietnam War, nicknamed the Living Room War, that the news really started to make money. For the first time ever, real images of war were being broadcast into hundreds and millions of homes across America. People were glued to their television, tuning in specifically to watch the news, to watch the war. Face it, fear sells. And the more sensationalized the headline, the better. Tonight at 10, find out what everyday product you use that's slowly killing you. But first, we bring you a viral video of a goat on a trampoline. I call it shock and aww. <laughs> but what was all this about kidnapping and a three-year-old boy getting killed and ticking time bombs in schools? Were those all just sensationalized headlines? Were those all just fake or false news? Well, let's start with the kidnapping. In 2014, Boko Haram terrorists kidnapped hundreds of girls from Shabuk, Nigeria. You may recognize this crime from the hashtag, bring back our girls. The Nigerian government called the kidnapping a hoax, but it wasn't a hoax, and calling it a hoax only delayed efforts to rescue the girls. One girl, known only as Hadiza, was among the 57 girls that escaped within the first few months of having been kidnapped. She jumped off the back of a Boko Haram truck, and she broke both of her legs in the process. But it wasn't enough for the Nigerian government to acknowledge the kidnapping and launch rescue efforts to save the girls. And to this day, hundreds of girls are still missing. Reports indicate that they've been married off to their kidnappers, some sold into slavery for about $5 a piece, some raped and murdered. Calling something a hoax when it is not, or calling something fake news when it is not, can cause an unwarranted degree of skepticism in the truth that can cause a 
serious negligence that can re result in substantive harm. Hadiza's pain and the pain of the surviving Shabbat girls and their family will be a daily reminder of the harm of calling a true news story a hoax or fake news. Now let's talk about this poor three-year-old boy. In 2014, a distraught Ukrainian woman described in detail how she witnessed the public execution of a three-year-old boy. She said he was tortured and then crucified in a crowded town square of Slavonsk in eastern Ukraine. Well, after the child was dead, she then said that the mother was tied to a tank and dragged through town until she was dead. While heart-wrenching and graphic, this story is 100% not true. It was a false news story that was aired in 2014 by Russia, Russia's government-controlled television station, Channel One. A team of investigative reporters that were already on Russia's use of fake news were able to confirm their suspicions that this, in fact, was merely just Russian propaganda intended to control the political narrative and paint the Ukrainian army as barbaric fascists. They've been able to even call any reports trying to debunk it and any efforts to try to expose the truth fake news in an effort to further cast doubt, control the political narrative, and ultimately subvert the truth. Perhaps one of the more pernicious examples of false news is a 1998 study claiming to link the MMR vaccine to autism. Now, this study has been widely debunked a number of times, and yet the anti-vaxxer movement seems to have gained more traction in recent years than ever before. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, anti-vaxxers and vaccine hesitancy are a top 10 global health threat. False information about vaccines is like a virus itself, and it spreads by anti-vaxxers sharing false news and calling the truth fake news. But why is this false narrative so persistent? In short, fear, ignorance, and the Dunning-Kruger effect. You see, one of the ways that fake and false news cause us real harm is by persuading us to form false beliefs. And we should care about forming false beliefs because our beliefs guide our actions, and our actions have consequences. And the consequences of our actions can affect our lives and the lives of others in significant ways. And considering our actions are generally taken to be solely our responsibility, we must be careful to ensure that our actions don't cause harm unless we're prepared to take responsibility for the harm they do cause. A false belief that the kidnapping was a hoax led to the prolonged entrapment of the Shabuk girls, Hadiza's need to escape, and her broken legs, as well as the untold fate of the remaining missing girls. A false belief that a three-year-old boy and his mother were murdered helped the Russian government to portray this picture of the Ukrainian army as barbaric fascists, which let them control the political narrative and, in turn, control the people themselves. A false belief that vaccines cause autism have resulted in anti-vaxxers not vaccinating their children, perpetuating vaccine hesitancy, and now they're a top 10 global health threat. So how exactly do fake and false news persuade us to form these false beliefs? By using fear to exploit our ignorance. You see, fear and ignorance make us vulnerable to deceit. Therefore, on all matters for which we lack knowledge, we are more prone to believe something's true when it's not, believe someone's an expert when they're not, believe something's dangerous when it's not. And we can be fooled and deceived by anybody. We can be deceived by other people, either intentionally, say, a liar, con man, or a political fear monger, or unintentionally, a gossip, or a lazy fact checker. We can even be deceived by ourselves. In fact, Wittgenstein says, nothing is so easy as deceiving oneself. One of the main ways in which we are vulnerable to self-deceit is in virtue of our own cognitive biases. Confirmation bias is perhaps one of the most popular and arguably the most common of all the cognitive biases. And confirmation bias is the tendency for individuals to seek out and interpret new information as supporting their pre-existing values and beliefs. By identifying these various cognitive biases, we can often prevent ourselves selves from making decisions on the basis of them in the future. But that's not always as easy as it sounds, because we're not experts at identifying our own intellectual shortcomings. 
Now, this graph may seem counterintuitive to some. Common sense might say the more you know, the more confident you are that you know it, or the more expertise you have in a particular field, the more confident you are that you're an expert. But Dunning and Kruger's study shows that that's not always the case. And in fact, for those who lack the appropriate self-awareness to identify their own incompetence, they actually suffer from a superior illusion bias, where they artificially inflate their degree of knowledge and become overly confident in it, and they believe that they know more than experts. In 2005, Dunning said, if you're incompetent, you can't know you're incompetent. The skill that's required to produce a right answer is the same skill that's required to know what a right answer is. In 2018, the University of Pennsylvania did a study that shows the explanatory power of the Dunning-Kruger effect on the stubborn false narrative of the anti-vaxxer movement. Based on their findings, they were able to show that individuals who knew very little about autism and vaccines were more likely to believe that they knew more than medical doctors and scientists. So how do we combat people thinking they know more than they do and you know, being subject to self-deceit by our own cognitive biases and the exploitation of our ignorance with fear? by asking questions and investigating the truth. As humans, we tend to fear the unknown. But if we replace that ignorance with knowledge, we can remove the fear and stop it from having any control over our beliefs and actions. We must be willing to investigate the truth with much more ferocity than we tend to. Just as someone might stop, take a deep breath, and count to 10 when they encounter something that might trigger their anger, so too should we be prepared to stop, take a deep breath, and ask who, what, when, where, why, and how. Various examples of these questions, and variations of them, can be asked of the source of the news and the content of the news. And by investigating them, we're forced to investigate the truth in a way that makes any inconsistencies in our own beliefs or inconsistencies in the information salient, making it easier to identify cognitive biases, and potential sources for misinformation. Consider these same questions in a murder investigation. Who did it? What did they do? When did they do it? How did they do it? Why did they do it? Sufficiently answering these questions in this context is more or less tantamount to solving the murder itself. Fake and false news are a real problem, and we are part of that problem. But one of the good things about being part of the problem is that we're primed to be part of the solution. Communicable, like the deadliest of all viruses, we have a biological and intellectual imperative to stop fake news from spreading. And luckily, there's stuff that we can all do collectively to stop it. We need to investigate suspicious content, like detectives or journalists, by asking who, what, when, where, why, and how. Remember the difference between false news and fake news, and don't forget, they both can cause real harm. We need to acknowledge that Ignorance and fear make us vulnerable to deceit. We need to try to replace that ignorance with knowledge to remove fear and stop it from having any control over our beliefs and actions. We also need to acknowledge that we are all vulnerable to succumbing to cognitive biases, and we need to try to avoid them the best that we can. But most importantly, if you don't know it's true, just don't share it. And that's all the news that's fit to print. Thank you.